Good night. It is 10.15 p.m. on Sunday, the 23rd of July, 2023. I'm going to be continuing with this book, The Making of a Modern Exorcist by Matt Baglio. And it will be from the fall, chapter 11, which will be from page 135... It will end on, it's not very long, about page 144. So that's 10 pages, which is okay at this time of night. So I'll begin with just one or two prayers. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love entrusts me here, ever this night be at my side, to light and guard, to rule and guide. Amen. Holy Michael Archangel, defend me in this day of battle. Be my safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, I humbly pray. And do thou, Prince of the heavenly host, by the power of God, thrust down to hell Satan and all the wicked evil spirits, who wander through the world for the ruin of souls. Amen. Father Gary Thomas, Town Cry, 1996. The Fall. The problems or crisis which arise, due to no fault of our own, a part of the human condition, we call mystery, and related to our own vulnerability, our mortality. One of Father Gary's idols, the late Joseph Cardinal Bernardin, who died of cancer in 1997, wrote, Whenever we are with people who suffer, it frequently becomes evident that there is very little we can do to help them other than be present to them, walk with them, as the Lord walks with us. For Father Gary, such feelings of powerlessness had manifested in the form of guilt. As he helped others overcome tragedy, whether administering last rites in a hospital or comforting a spouse dealing with a nasty divorce, he was very well aware that he had got off relatively scot-free. While he certainly did not wish horrible things upon himself, he could not help but wonder, why has not anything happened to me? In the summer, excuse me, I still have this cold, I apologise. In the summer of 1997, Father Gary was pastor at St. Nicholas Parish, a position he had held since being promoted from associate pastor in 1993. Initially, he had started out with high hopes, for the parish, St. Nicholas, was a quaint 250-seat church located a few blocks from the upscale boutiques and coffee houses of downtown Los Altos. There was a real sense of community here. It was the kind of town where he could get to know each and every one of his parishioners. A few things needed fixing, but on the whole, with the right leadership, the parish had the potential to be a good Christian community. In addition, he relished the challenge of dealing with important leaders. One of the founders of Adobe was a parishioner and he hoped his actions would foster an environment in which prayer and the Eucharist would inspire them to make the right decisions. After four years, though, his vision had not panned out. Try as he might, 
to engage some of his parishioners, apathy seemed to prevail. Was he setting his expectations too high? Perhaps, after all, not everybody has enough time for work and family as it is, let alone time to volunteer at the church. Los Altos being smack dab in the middle of Silicon Valley and the technological rat race did not help either. Perhaps he was frustrated at the materialistic society in general, which forces people to dedicate so much time and energy to work in the first place. He also took responsibility why had he not been able to motivate his parishioners? Was he doing enough? These were questions that bothered him during the spring and summer of 1997. Excuse me a moment, I still have this cold irritating me, sorry. Around the same time, Jim Michaletti, a former parishioner of Father Gary's, was undergoing similar soul-searching. Originally from Palo Alto, Jim and his wife had moved to a town in the foothills of Yosemite called Twain Harte, where Jim worked as a teacher in a school for troubled teens. Father Gary had vacation time, so the two decided to get together and turn to the Lord for help. They went for a hike with Jim's two golden retrievers, Buck and Spitz, to a place called Three Pools, which was near the Lion's Lake Reservoir. The day was incredibly hot and Jim carried a backpack with a Bible and two water bottles. On the way out, they hiked up a dry riverbed which snaked through the South Fork Stanislaus River Canyon. Here and there, the ground was broken by rocks and boulders, some as big as small cars. While not treacherous, the hike could be tricky. At one point, while making his way over a large rock, Father Gary slipped and sprained his ankle. As a result, on their way back, Jim decided they should take a different path. A little deer trail bordered the riverbed and it seemed, seemed easier to negotiate. After a few minutes of paralleling the riverbed, however, the trail rose steeply until eventually the two were walking along the edge of a 60-foot cliff. When they came to a section of the trail where some rocks were covered by moss, Jim's dog Buck slipped and tumbled over the edge, disappearing from view. Imagining his dog twisted and dead among the rocks below, Jim peered over the edge but was unable to see anything. I have got to go down and see if Buck is alive, he called, tossing the backpack to Father Gary. Stay here with Spitz and keep him away from the cliff and watch out for that rock. He pointed to the moss-covered rock. Jim then hurried down the nearby cliff, scrambling and half slid, sliding, until he reached the bottom. When he finally made it over to Buck, the dog was miraculously still alive, sitting up on a patch of dirt between two clumps of jagged rocks. He Had he landed a couple of feet in either direction, he would have been killed. Instead, his only injury was a badly broken leg. Relieved, Jim started back up. However, as he scaled the steep incline hand over fist, he heard Father Gary shout, Oh God! Followed by the sickening thud 
as his body hit the ground a few moments later. From where he was, Jim could not see where Father Gary had fallen, but there was no question in his mind that his friend had just died. Oh my God, he thought, I have just killed a priest. When Jim finally reached him, Father Gary was lying on his back, just a few feet from Buck, like the dog. He had narrowly missed the jagged rocks, but his face was covered with blood and he was not moving. Expecting the worst, Jim was surprised to see that Father Gary was still alive, but just barely. His face was cut and one eye was basically a pool of blood. His kneecap appeared to be shattered and it was impossible to know whether he had any internal injuries. Father, can you hear me? It's me, Jim, he shouted. Father Gary moaned. Jim reached out and Father Gary gripped his hand tightly, which Jim took as a good sign. Trying to establish how cognizant he was, he asked him to recite the Lord's Prayer in Latin. Pater Noster, qui es calis, sanctificatur nomen tuum. Father Gary began weakly, continuing until he finished the prayer. Jim was relieved. No obvious brain damage, but his friend's breathing was shallow. At that point, Jim faced a difficult decision. Should he stay with Father Gary or run for help? Going for help would mean going back down the riverbed over the rocks and boulders for about a mile and a half before he could reach South Fork Bridge, where he could hope to flag down somebody with a cell phone. If not, he would have to hoof it into town another five miles down a dirt road. Father Gary might not last that long. He agonised over the decision for a few seconds before realising he had no choice. He bent down and gave Father Gary a little blessing on his forehead. Then he turned and ran. Sprinting over the uneven ground, he screamed for help. It was like one of those nightmares when his legs could not carry him fast enough. While he ran, he prayed, Lord, please keep watch over him. Please keep him alive. Finally, he reached the bridge and was able to flag down two old men in a beat-up pickup truck. Neither had a cell phone. A man is going to die, he screamed. We have to get help. Perhaps alarmed by Jim's appearance in his rush to get to the bridge, he had somehow lost his shirt. The men balked. With his adrenaline pumping, Jim reached out and throttled one. Get in your car right now and let's go. They acquiesced and once they'd all piled in, drove off. Much to Jim's dismay, however, the old heap would only go about 20 miles an hour. About a mile down the road, they passed an SUV heading in the opposite direction that Jim was able to flag down. Luckily, this couple had a cell phone. After describing what had happened, he left them calling 911 while he took off back in Father Gary's direction, hoping his friend would be alive when he got there. When Jim finally reached the cliff, he saw that an amazing thing had happened during his absence. Three hikers who had heard his calls for help had come to investigate. As Jim sprinting up, he saw one who turned out to be a nurse, bending over Father Gary and talking to him. The nurse had mopped Father Gary's face using Jim's discarded shirt and had kept him alert by talking to him. However, Father Gary was going in and out of consciousness and his vital signs were low. He could go at any time, she warned Jim. Still, their only option was to wait for help. Moving him would risk further damage. Over the next two hours, Jim and the nurse stayed with Father Gary, praying with him, consoling him and each other.
Finally, rescue personnel, including paramedics, members of the two alumni, county sheriff's search and rescue team, and a few Stanilaus National Forest Rangers began arriving. After doing what they could to stabilise Father Gary, the paramedics called in a helicopter, only to learn that all were out doing rescues in Yosemite. They would have to wait for a helicopter to fly up from Lemoore Naval Air Station near Fresno, nearly a hundred miles away. After an hour or so, the stillness was broken by the loud thump thumping of a helicopter approaching from the south. The Navy had sent a large CH-46 Sea Knight with twin rotors. By then, it was late afternoon, about four hours after Gary, Father Gary had fallen. For Jim, the sound of the approaching helicopter was extremely comforting. If Father can just hold on, he thought. After circling for a few several minutes, the crewman was lowered in a metal basket. Father Gary was placed inside and the crewman hooked the line up while the helicopter thundered overhead. The massive twin rotors shaking the trees violently with their downdraft. While this was going on, Jim remembers the crewman saying more than once, We're losing him. As Father Gary's blood pressure dipped dangerously low, when everything was set, the crewman got on top of the basket to secure it, and the helicopter lifted them into the sky, whipping through the air like a child's toy. As the helicopter disappeared from view, Jim and the other rescuers exchanged hugs. Gathering up their gear, they made their way down to South Fork Bridge. Jim's dog, Buck, was hoisted onto a stretcher, the one intended for Father Gary, and carried along as well while Spitz followed on foot. When they reached the road, Jim was confronted by an amazing sight. The bridge was packed with every kind of rescue vehicle imaginable, including about 10 fire trucks. In addition, a large earth mover had been employed in an attempt to carve out a road through the riverbed, though after 50 yards, this idea had apparently been abandoned. Meanwhile, Father Gary was flown to a nearby abandoned golf course and dropped down on the ninth green, where a life flight helicopter was waiting to fly him to Memorial Medical Centre in Modesto. Nobody on board thought he was going to make it. In Modesto, the doctors immediately went to work, performing a series of operations on Father Gary, the first of which lasted about 14 hours. His injuries were extensive. The accident had fractured the C6 and C7 vertebrae in his neck, carved in a part of his skull shattered his right wrist and this injury could, would not be discovered until later, damaged the carpal tunnel, severed his orbital nerve, broken his kneecap and turned his right elbow to dust. In addition, his face was severely lacerated and bruised and would require over a hundred stitches. The big question was brain damage. His head injury was serious and the surgeons would not know the extent of the damage until they opened his skull. After the surgery, the doctors had good news. The brain membrane was intact, so there would be no brain damage. 
He also would not be paralysed since he had broken only two, only two, of the three bones in his neck. Breaking all three can lead to paralysis. This relative stroke of luck was attributed to his probably falling directly onto the water bottles in the backpack, which somehow cushioned the blow. The only real doubt was whether he would be able to use his elbow again. They had scoped it out twice, cleaning out shattered bone, but the damage was extensive. For the following two days, Father Gary remained heavily sedated and in the ICU. He underwent another 11-hour operation and while he was conscious, the shock of the accident combined with the drugs clouded his mind. Doctors assured his parents that he would eventually come out of the fog. The whole time his parents, his friends and numerous priests kept a vigil over him. In addition, prayer services were held throughout the diocese as word got round about Father Gary's terrible accident. On the fourth day, much to everyone's relief, Father Gary came around waking up in the ICU wearing a neck brace, a cast on his arm and bandages on his knee. Seeing his mother standing over him, he posed the obvious question. What happened? Don't you remember? She said. In truth, he did not. The last thing he recalled was Jim handing him the backpack what am I doing here? He said. She broke it to him. You fell off a cliff. He struggled to understand. What day is it? She told him it was Saturday. I have two weddings to do today, he responded. The doctor smiled. <laughs> That's great. He remembers. After spending 10 days at Modesto, he was transferred to Sequoia for 20 days of rehabilitation. After yet another operation in August to repair his wrist, he went to stay with his folks, battered and bruised and barely able to function. After losing about a third of the mobility in his right hand, he could not do even simple tasks, such as buttoning his shirt. Taking a leave of absence, he spent the next eight months recuperating at his parents' house in San Mateo, going to Stanford for rehab twice a week and doing an additional six hours of therapy every day at home back exercises, knee exercises and neck exercises. Some part of his body always needed to be addressed. Almost immediately, the effect of post-traumatic stress began to take its toll. At times the pain was unbearable. Unable to bathe or go to the bathroom by himself, he felt uncomfortable with his own body and stripped of all dignity. His hair had been shaved for the surgery on his skull and coupled with that there were the bruises and numerous facial lacerations. He barely recognised himself in a mirror which proved an apt metaphor for how he felt about life in general. In addition to his other injuries, the fractured skull caused a constant sensation of vertigo, necessitating that he walk with a cane. Beyond this, 
he began to obsess about the cause of the accident and about when, if ever, he would feel whole again. At the hospital, Jim had half-jokingly called him Lazarus because he seemed to have been raised from the dead. But now that he was in so much pain, he began to question his faith wondering why God had allowed him to survive at all. Now he was the one who needed tending, and he understood the plight of many parishioners in an entirely new way. Physical pain does not hold a candle to depression, he thought. Going back to work, which he did in November 1997, at first easing in one day a week, helped him stop obsessing. By January 1998, he increased his work schedule to three days a week. And by April, just nine months after his accident, he was back to full time. At first, it was not easy going. He still walked with a cane, had a shaved scalp and a face disfigured with scars. He was very self-conscious about his appearance. There were days when he would tell the staff, bear with me today, I'm feeling, I'm really depressed and it's not you. At times his depression got so bad that he con contemplated suicide. Over and over he would ask the same question. Why did God save me on those rocks? Why didn't he let me die? In the end, the only thing that pulled him through was his reluctance to leave the world that way. Thinking about his parents quickly put an end to his suicidal thoughts. He would never burden them with that grief. He began taking medication and went to a trauma clinician, recommended by one of his parishioners, who helped him find relief through a techni technique known as EMDR. I movement, desensitization and reprocessing. He also went to healing masses at St. Joseph's in Capitola. Already a big believer in the sacrament of the sick in which the priest prays for the person to be healed in body, soul and in spirit. He found the masses helpful not only for the blessings they bestowed but also because they helped him reconnect with the healing ministry of Christ and with the power of prayer. In August 1998, he went to a neurologist, Dr Susan Hansen, also his parishioner, to find out why his vertigo had not gone away. In the process of doing an MRI, Dr Hansen inadvertently answered the question that had been tormenting Father Gary. She surmised that Father Gary's heart murmur must have caused his heart to throw a clot, in turn leading him to having a slight stroke before the fall. The stroke would have caused him to be disorientated and as a result, he had probably just walked off the cliff. The MRI also exposed the fact that Father Gary has a dangerously enlarged heart and if that condition had gone undetected for much longer, he could have suffered a major heart attack. The second he heard the news, he felt healed. He was elated as he shared this revelation with his parents and Jim. I don't know why I'm so damn excited, he confessed. 
but the realisation that he had not done anything wrong was a huge relief. In January 1999, nearly two years after his accident, he underwent one last operation to chisel down the bone growth in his elbow, which enabled him to have full movement of his arm again. He was finally healed, spiritually and physically. Because of this accident, Father Gary comprehended the depths of suffering following a traumatic event and could respond in a uniquely empathetic way to people who were convalescing or depressed. He also saw the importance of prayer in the healing process. As a result of the benefit he gained from the healing masses he attended, he planned on conducting a weekly healing mass at St Nicholas. Perhaps the most important thing he took away from his accident was that it helped him to understand the concept that suffering was the cross, which ultimately brought him closer to God. He could see now that suffering was a part of life and that nobody escapes this world unscathed. That is an incredible story, so I'm going to stop there. Thank you for listening. May God bless you and heal you if you need healing. Pray more, pray all the time. Go to healing masses and trust in God. I'll be doing the next chapter as soon as possible, maybe tomorrow. I think it's a bit late to start another one at this time of night. I think it's nearly 11 o'clock. <laughs> God bless you all. Have a wonderful week.